welcome. Uh, we really, really appreciate that you're going to spend this hour with us. Uh, it's amazing, and especially it would be great if I start the presentation. <laughs> that would work. Yeah. Uh, we're going to talk about achieving maximal, maximum stability uh, in vSphere environments using uh, PowerCLI-assisted documentation scripts. Um, I do encourage, if you're not using Twitter today, sign up. There's a hashtag for this session, SER2077BU. I'm going to be looking at that after the session, as, as, as especially I would really appreciate if anybody can take pictures of us, because I want to show this to my mother and my wife later on, and send it out <laughs> to the hashtag. <laughs> Make them proud. Yeah. This is a disclaimer. Every session you're going to see has that, so I'm sure you're going to be bored by that later on. And that's our agenda. So let's start with introductions, shall we? So we're both Sanchez, and we're not related. We actually But we're the Sanchez brothers. <laughs> people call, call us the Sanchez brothers. Uh, we're longtime co-workers uh, since 2009. We're good friends. Uh, I'm Ariel Sanchez Mora, uh, at Ariel Sanchez Mora on Twitter. Twitter actually didn't let me put my full name there. I just started working for VMware in April as a TAM, a technical account manager. Thank you. Thank you for that. TAM is a really cool job. I'm, I'm really enjoying it. But I've been a customer coming to VMworld since 2014. And the thing I love the most is that social interaction. So you'll probably find me near the VMTN and the VBrown by Community stage. Uh, later on, if you want to continue a conversation. Um, Edgar Sanchez, Operating Systems Engineer with Converges. Um, I was a core um, co-employee with Ariel. Um, we've been friends for over 10 years, and even though he moved on to a better career, we still keep in touch. Uh, this is my first VMworld, yay. <laughs> uh, when he told me to help him co-present this presentation, I didn't imagine this um, crowd and this huge size um, room. Yeah, we really um, thank you for that. It's an honor and I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> you, for you forgot to mention about the hackathon tonight. You're going to be in Team 1 doing PCI and PowerCLI. Yeah, even though you're going to hear me talk about PowerCLI today, I'm by no means an expert. I am you know, consider myself a newbie still learning it, so I'll be participating and learning a lot in the hackathon. If um, anyone have not joined any of those and there's still room, I strongly encourage you guys to get involved. All right, so first a show of hands. How many people here have started a new job and found that the documentation was lacking? Yeah, exactly. You're in the right room. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I love this slide. This is the proof slide by VMware. <laughs> and we were saying there's a very low percentage of admins who are really satisfied with the vSphere documentation and documentation in general. And worse, when you ask when it is, you may get a reaction just like this, right? <laughs> what you mean, documentation? Everything's yeah. here, yeah. right? <laughs> and that leads to you in the data center on the second day and try to figure out if this is really the host where I'm trying to do something or is this really the NIC? Yeah. This doesn't really help stability. It doesn't help you either. No. <laughs> All right. So everybody here knows that stability is a very, it's the most important goal, really. If you don't have availability, you really, are, you, you, you don't really worry about performance. And that's our core responsibility as VMware engineers. We have to provide uptime. Um, VMware has been tremendous for that in giving us software uh, choices that ensure or improve stability and uptime. And yet we still find a lot of administrators are having trouble and, you know, the typical troubles of firefighting, lack of confidence when doing changes and upgrades. And you, we run into the situation when a person is the expert, he's a hoarder of information, he doesn't really share, but he can't get vacations. So it's, it's a very vicious cycle. Or it's the smartest person in the team, and you, know, you become, a, at that point, a um, point of failure, a single point of failure, right? Um, if you need to take an emergency um, um, leave or you're going on vacation, your phone will be ringing that you know, you got to help shut down fires. All right. So we're going to talk about achieving stability, which is really why you're here. You want to get better at that. And these are the key points that we're going to start making. Uh, everything is recorded. We're going to publish the presentation later. I promise you don't need to write down except what you want to write down. It will be shared. You're going to see that we're really into sharing and stuff. All right. So if you want stability, you, want, you have to make it a primary focus. 
it just doesn't happen by accident, right? Um, I, maybe a lot of you have already seen this XKCD comic where this person says, you know, we, we got the building, but someone came in, killed everybody, and connected the cables. And he was muttering something about uptime. Oh, this is a sysadmin that we're dealing with, <laughs> right? So another, another thing that I'll, I'll say is you guys here are probably the best of your companies, and that your companies are betting that you guys are going to give the vision to lead them forward. So there's an opportunity for leadership when we talk about stability and uh, making a primary focus that you can come back to your team and tell them about this session and show them what, what you're going to learn today here. For the guys in the back, there's room over here. Please, please come on down. I don't want you to be uh, you know, standing up all the time. All right, so we're going to talk about the things that gave you stability in the first place. You have to invest in good design. You have to invest in enterprise components. If you don't have someone that has gone to classes or whatever, you, you want to groom that person. You want to send the first person to class and him come back and teach the others, right? Um, when you are purchasing things and you're assembling this Lego that is your data center, you don't want to purchase you know, bad components. You want to get the, the real Lego bricks, et cetera, et cetera. You have to be very careful as well when you are configuring it that you're following the best practices. And, and best practice is a word that is used a lot, but at least you should have HCL validation, and you should know that you're running supported configurations. I know budget is sort of a constraint in most IT departments, right? I've never heard of an IT department that has unlimited budget. So, but try, try to always um, have the same model of servers or the same sort of specs across is a good practice to have a standard. Mm -hmm. And you also want, when you already chose VMware, which is an enterprise software, you want to choose other third-party vendors that work well with VMware and keep up to date with VMware. If you're using a vendor that they have not released their code for 6.5 and we're already at 6.5 update one, you're probably not hooking up to the guys that are really taking this very seriously, right? Uh, there's the, the vSphere validated designs. Those are a great resource if you want to learn about design. and. If you are responsible for creating designs, take the classes, take the certifications. You really learn a lot in them. It's very important, especially when um, you're upgrading, right? Who here in the room are still in um, lower versions than vCenter 6.5 or ESXi 6.5? Yeah. Right. How, many, how, how many are still in 5.5, though? Yes. Right here. Exactly. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, there, there's a lot of um, talks at this VMworld about that, and um, it's very interesting, and especially um, for how to, um, what the steps you need to do to, to get there, right? That, um, the validated design is definitely a good resource for that. Yeah. Well, one thing that's very important to understand is people and processes are more important and will affect the stability more over the li lifetime of your five years that you expect these things to work than the original design, because the original design will probably change. You will adjust it and do some things differently. But one thing that we have always said is if your administrators don't have time to properly plan, to properly learn, to properly communicate, teach each other, do knowledge transfer, you are, are going to have a problem, and it's going to be a big problem at that point. So always uh, figure out that if your engineers are telling you, if you're telling your engineers, if the business is telling you, we need this change right now, you should push back and tell them, well, let me read about it. Let me, let me think this a little bit. Let me make sure I have someone else validate this with me. Yeah, measure twice, cut once, right? Always mm -hmm. plan for the worst. Don't expect things so. Um, mm -hmm. every, engineer, every engineer wants a win. We, we, we want to make it work, right? So just push back a little, make sure that you have a pilot-copilot relationship and all those things, right? When is the stability, especially at risk, when you're making changes? So this is when you actually have to take the time to do, you know, you have to take the time to understand that this is a high risk period. Changes in the environment, changes in the staff. You may get a new team member that is suddenly in charge of doing a, a change on the weekend. You want to make sure that this team member understands everything that he's going to be doing. Uh, patching is normally a very benign change in our, in for, for VMware, but upgrading can be quite different. You, the HCL may change from one version to the other. So you want to have the time to actually research all those things. So it comes back to having enough bandwidth, right? Yes. And one other thing, stability is our goal, but it's not guaranteed. So when you have a problem, you want to be able to resolve it as fast as possible. That means being prepared for outages, right? You want fast access to precise, 
and relevant information, and you want to make sure that whoever is actually responding to the outage can actually do the things that are needed. They have the proper access and authorization to actually go ahead and make the change needed, right? Other things that we find a lot of people, especially junior admins as they come along, is they may not understand the escalation levels that you have to follow both with your vendor. When you open a ticket, when do you escalate? How, what, what support did you buy and what, what's guaranteed there? Also escalation levels inside your company. At what point do you notify your manager, the director, et cetera? This is something that should be clearly spelled out. The disaster recovery is also very important, right? Um, it's not just a document where you have a process to follow. It's something that should be um, validated and tested. Yeah. There's a bunch of plans that have never been tested. Well, only in text. Mm -hmm. And if you're a manager, if you're a leader, if you run into the management track, you want to make sure that you build collaborative teams. You want people that are good communicators, that are self-learners, but they like sharing as well what they learn. And they have maturity and good manners. Cordiality is important in a team. Who here has, is here at VMworld not worried that they got to be called to shut down fires at their work? Wow. So there's, there's few, <laughs> very few people that yeah. are not worried about work right now. So we do have a lot of key players in, that yeah. you are in your team. And if you are in, in a team, you want to make sure that standardization and clear processes are something that everybody has access to and everybody has agreed and, and said, yes, okay, this is the process that we'll follow. And make sure that your documentation, which is something we'll talk about in a little bit, is accessible to everybody. So again, peer review, load sharing, you know, you should not always be the one doing some things. If you are the so-called subject matter expert, you should have someone that's your backup. So always, always make sure that you're not the, the only guy that knows how to do this, right? Yeah, Pilot Copilot works very well. It's something that Errol and I um, practice a lot. And it, it, it gives us very good results. The number of errors and outages that you run into fat finger mistakes were reduced. Yeah, because I do fat finger a lot. And understanding that we win as a team, as a team, right? It's, it's really what the business wants is that things work. It's not, they don't want to say you're a rock star. Okay. So leaders empower, nurture and provide direction, get out of the way, let them lead. Perfect. So we're now we're gonna be talking about the importance of documentation. Um, this another XKCD comic where the guy is calling, hey, I, I forgot the server password. Who here has had one of those hosts that were built a long time ago in a location that's not normally very much used and they have to do a change and they can't because they don't know who built it with password. Or don't even know the iDRAC or the ILO. Or the ILO, or the ILO credentials, yes. All right, so those are the key points that we're going to talk about. We're going to focus on documentation now. We're going to start with company-wide IT documentation. And that can, show, that can tell you that uh, English is a second language speaker, that should say like org chart for all business units, and especially for the IT team. You should understand how the IT team is meant to work. Um, you should have also a repository of company locations. If you work in multi-site environments, you should understand, okay, this is the location list, this is where our site names are per location, this is the address, and this is the IT contact that I can reach out to. In an outage situation, this can save you valuable time. You should also understand and, pro and have the documentation for the infrastructure services that you as a vSphere administrator rely on. You need to know what's the AD, what's the subnetting, what's the routing, what's the firewall segments, What's a DNS servers, NTP, syslog? These are all things that you, sh you should have. It's probably someone else's responsibility, but you should understand, okay, if for all these sites in America, you may want to use this server, but once you move to Europe, you may have something different. Also very important to understand is the IT workflows. How do you actually communicate to the other teams, request changes, get help from the network team, the storage team, the AD team? You just want to know who you need to reach out to if you need help from other departments, right? Especially um, in large environments, the VMware administration is one department, the network guys and the storage guys are two other departments. Yeah. So whenever you need help, it's, it's always good to know where to go look for. Yeah, and also it happens that a lot of getting the, your bearings in the first week on the job is getting to know people and exactly what's allowed. So if this is actually documented somewhere, you can have your people be productive much faster. Another thing that you should have is your vendor relationships and your name contacts. There's several vendors for support. They will only take calls from 
these people. So like a friend of mine said, so you should know how to impersonate that person. <laughs> when we're talking about vSphere documentation properly, uh, hopefully you had, someone actually wrote a design and this is what we tried to achieve. So you have that somewhere. It's super important, especially as the years go by, to be able to look at what the, the person that built this environment was thinking. But you also want to have installation instructions, hardening instructions. Uh, you want to have a log of everything that's installed so that you know, okay, this server was installed this date by this person. You want to have, sorry, patching instructions. You want to keep a log, especially if you are in, in PCI or other audit environments. They will actually ask for those things. Version control is very important, right? Yeah, in, in every document that you create, you should have version control. Yeah. So this is a lot of you should, you should, but. <laughs> Best practice. Yeah, but it, it just grows. Documentation should grow and change over time, but you should still keep using it. It should be useful to you. And especially if you're doing big projects like a vSphere upgrade from 5 to 5, you should have a good way that all the team can collaborate and see what's pending and what's, what's moving. One of the things as, as vSphere administrators that we face is, well, this is changing. You know, cloud is different. I'm not going to be the, y, the guy always managing the host now. I may outsource to a vendor. But our point of view is as long as you own the uptime, your job includes documentation. You are ultimately responsible for making things work. Yes. Right. And I was thinking when they, when they did a, that VMware on AWS announcement, I'm wondering how much power CLI we can actually run against. Oh, I'm sure they'll come. They'll come There's probably going to be a yeah. lot, yeah. So we mentioned scripting, right? Most of the things that you see in vCenter and in the, your host can be scripted. So that's Multiple actually ways. great. Multiple ways. Multiple ways. Multiple ways. The, the one thing that you probably should worry about is keeping a good track of where the vCenters have been installed, what their IP address are. But once you have access to that vCenter, you can probably script a lot of the documentation. Uh, there's actually, we're, we're presenting a project today, but it's, it's, a it's a recopilation of other projects. There's several other projects that have done very well in gathering information from environments, such as vCheck, which is uh, based on PowerCLI, RVTools, which is based on .NET, very good. And uh, there's a, actually a, a really good vCenter documentation script these are all things that you'll be able to Google and find very easily uh, because that, and I'm sorry, that vCenter documentation script actually outputs a Word document and tells you about the clusters and stuff. So big shout out to Alan Renouf, Rob DeBeige, and Jay Rutsky, which have been creating these projects for quite a long time. How many and of you guys are, are aware are familiar, that these yeah. tools exist? Yeah, very good. Awesome. Very, very good. But it just so happens that we committed to PowerCLI. We thought that this was the, the tool that's going to keep getting improved. So we're going to talk about PowerCLI and the V community. So curious, everybody here know PowerShell? Use PowerShell mm -hmm. daily, mm -hmm. run commands, run scripts. scripts. Right? How many of you have installed PowerCLI? Good. How mm -hmm. many have installed it from the PowerShell gallery? All right. Awesome. Okay, that's good. That's good. So this is a quote from the Cathedral, Cathedral of the Bazaar. Good programmers know what to write. Well, the, the, the translated quote is steel code, right? If, if, if somebody else already got it and... It's sharing, man. It's sharing. It's, it's sharing. sharing. It's, it's all love. Um, but if somebody else already figured it out, grab that, adapt that. Don't reinvent the wheel. Yeah, right. exactly. Don't reinvent the wheel. So these are the key points that we're going to go about. Um, for the few that didn't know much about PowerShell, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but it's, it's based on, uh, PowerCLI is based on, it works on PowerShell, on, Microsoft, on the Microsoft technology. It's relatively easy to install and pick up. Uh, there's a PowerCLI core version that came out for Mac and Linux. We actually haven't tested it yet. We want to do that at some point. It keeps getting improved. Like, they release a lot, and maybe every two months, they release new commandlets for Vs and SRM, Horizon, and they keep improving the vSphere core. And for us, the, the main thing is the, the V community, you know, the community of administrators that are out there helping each other. There's a lot of resources there, and there's a lot of help going on. Non-Microsoft users have the opportunity to use VS Code now as an editor for PowerShell, right? Is there any uh, VS Code adopters out here today? Yeah, awesome. I, myself, am slowly starting to transition into it from the um, PowerShell um, ice, right? My understanding that the VS Code will be the replacement of ICE. I don't think they'll um, put any more releases out there of ICE. Yeah. 
so a huge thank you to the greats that helped us create our product. But, you know, Alan Renouf, Luke Deckens, William Lamb, Brian Graff, Kyle Rudy, Chris Wall. These are all people. Again, if you're not on Twitter, you want to follow these people. They are really smart. They are really good into sharing. Uh, VMTN has a forum section. How many people have a, a, a VMTN login, actually log into that? Yeah, it, it, it's amazing because the PowerCLI community VMTN is very big and there's a lot of code there. The VMware Code, which is a very cool initiative that VMware is doing about everybody that has a little of a developer side, um, they have a Slack channel and that Slack channel is very useful. If you haven't used Slack, that's a, a one that you can actually join today. And there's a, a lot of bloggers and admins that have really shared their code in several ways, right? So there's this spirit of building and sharing with each other is what we really also uh, embraced for this project. Yes. Mm -hmm. So our project is, we call it V-documentation. We search. Nope, it wasn't taken. So that, that, that works. The word at least. And uh, so, so these are really just power C like commands that help you create vSphere documentation and help you create it easily. Uh, we have four commands today, and we're going to be deep, dipping diver into them in a little while. Uh, but it's basically completely open to use. You can use them today, and um, please let us know what you think about them. And um, use the hashtag, uh, the hashtag documentation on Twitter, because Edgar and I have committed to actually help anybody that is having problems with them, trying to use them, or that wants a feature added or changed. We're going to be there for a while. We'll so. try to help as much as we can. Exactly. <laughs> All right, so with so many good tools out there that several people have used, why did we start a new one? Well, we were administrators that were beginning at some point, and it took us a while. It was kind of difficult for us to start. And I'm not by no means a PowerShell or PowerCLI expert, and I taught Edgar. <laughs> so a year ago, Edgar didn't know PowerCLI at all. So you can see that with a little help from the community and a little willingness to learn, yes. we actually got pretty far, and well, at least far enough. And we wanted to then make something that was very simple to use. Very simple to use, very simple instructions, very simple defaults. If you start with one-liners, that's, that's your beginning point, right? And the best way to start with PowerCLI is running reports, right? Because that's, that's what management and that's what makes your managers happy and actually helps you to have your documentation also. Yeah. And you, you're not going to cause any problems if you're just pulling reports too. So Absolutely. it's a great way to start. Yes. Uh, and we decided to output to Excel. Excel, I've always found it was really easy. If I wanted to, if I had a bunch of data, I could start filtering. So I thought Excel is, Excel is going to work fine. And um, we're, our goal right now is to get it added to the official PowerCLI example scripts. So I'm going to keep pushing Kyle Rudy until he lets us. Oh, yes. Yeah. So we're going to do a little showcase. Uh, we're going to take you to our GitHub page. Um, we are no experts on GitHub either. We just started, yeah. we knew that people were sharing there. I want to know how we're doing on time, Ariel. The, um, the, the timer didn't go off. Yeah, yeah, the timer didn't go off. So apologies while, while I send this out to... We have 25? Oh, okay. We have lots of time. All right. All right. Awesome. So this is the reason why we're here, right? Um, this is the project um, landing page. Make sure you add it to your favorite. Make sure you keep um, checking periodically as updates get, get posted. Um, <clears throat> since we've had a consensus in the room that there is a lot of PowerShell users and PowerCLI users, um, the introduction here might be already common to you guys as you're up and running with the shell already. But for any new uh, members here that, that are new or that are going to start using it, I'll just give a quick overview of it. Um, what you want to do is make sure you have um, PowerShell 5, which, you know, it's in Microsoft World, it's, they call it the Windows Management Framework. Um, that's, 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 a, that's a version where we sort of wrote these scripts and tested them out. And um, for you to configure certain aspects on PowerShell, for you to run script, you got to run PowerShell as an administrator, right, UAC mode. And one of the essential things you want to configure in PowerShell is to tell it that you want to run scripts, because by default, it allows you to run commands, or you could copy-paste the script on the, on, on the command shell, and it would execute. But if you do the command set execution policy to remote sign, then you're allowing for scripts execution. 
the other command <clears throat> you see there on the screen is to configure the, um, the certificate action when you connect to vCenter. Anybody here use custom certificates on their vCenter deployments today? Must be PCI requirement, secured environment. So, so, this, so, this, so there's a lot that are running with the default side, self sign cert. You don't need to yeah, see that warning every this time. This won't probably apply to you, but we found that um, not bypassing this warning kind of breaks your script and certain command lists won't return all of the information. So setting that to ignore, it's just kind of silently ignores it and mm -hmm. then you get the results for it. <clears throat> so um, one of the neat things about the V documentation module is that it's available in PowerShell Gallery, right? You have it on the GitHub page, but you could also download it directly to your workstation as the same way you do when you install uh, the Power um, CLI. And, and so, that's, a, that's a big credit to you because you were like, I'm gonna put this in the gallery. And I thought, no way, you're not gonna put this in the gallery. Like, no, oh, yeah, hold on, I'm gonna yeah. put this in the gallery. We're gonna continue to host it on GitHub um, simply because um, we want it to, for it to be open to the community. Anybody's welcome to download it, to edit it, to modify it. If anyone's interested to um, make an enhancement to it, by all means, go ahead and fork it. Um, Ariel is the primary administrator there, and I'm sure he'll be more than happy to, to allow it to you. So the three command lists to install um, is, is um, you want to go back a little bit, Eric? Yep. Install module, the um, VMware Power CLI. The import Excel module that you see there is what allows you to export to Excel. Um, that module allows you to export a native Excel file format without the need of Excel. So if you run these Power CLI scripts from a jump box, you don't have to install Microsoft Office to be able to export to Excel. Um, uh, further down on the frequently asked question of the um, project page, you have a link to it where you can um, read more about it if you like. Yep, and then the install module, the documentation for, for, um, for our PowerShell module. If you notice, the scope is the current user, right? If you're gonna run this from a jump box and multiple VMware admins are gonna run it, it's probably a good idea to um, install it as scope all users, but you'll need to run PowerShell as elevated as an administrator. Edgar, I was going to tell you, why don't you drive so you can move the mouse? It's probably easier. Okay. Yeah. So with those three commands, you're successfully um, installed the media documentation module and you're on your way to start generating um, very cool reports that will help you document your vSphere environment, right? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> if you want to verify what module version you're running on, the get module v documentation, that would give you the module version and will also give you the functions that are exported on it. We currently, um, like Errol mentioned before, we have four functions currently exported on it. And um, this, this is one way for you to verify what you're running on. And once you um, look at the GitHub page, you could know when there's an update posted and you could go back and update it here. <clears throat> so before you start running any of the functions, there is a requirement that you are connected to a vCenter. Right, the, the script won't prompt you for a vCenter to connect to. That's a given, you gotta connect to it, right? Simply because- To, to one vCenter or many vCenters? The script supports many vCenters. That's a very good question, right? Um, anyone knows in Power, um, Power CLI how to configure it so that you could connect to multiple vCenters at the same time? Or anybody use that feature? I think by default it allows, it allows you, right? By default, you only connect to one server. You uh, gotta change the configuration for it. Awesome. You have to so, add that. Yeah. So if you connect to multiple vCenters, you gotta keep in mind that if you run a command and you don't specify the parameter for it, you're querying the entire environment. <clears throat> so once you're connected to vCenter, then you have the option to run any of the commands. And those are the four function commands. Get ESX inventory, get ESX IO device, get ESX networking, and get ESX storage. We kind of go um, over them briefly and, and, and um, break we're gonna, into We're going to get into the meat and potatoes in a little bit. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. I think, I think they're ready for it. All right. <laughs> awesome. <clears throat> so the commandment, um, the, the commandlets, um, if you don't specify a parameter or a switch, it would query the entire environment. And all of that it, uh, output will be presented on your screen, right? And the, um, these are the common um, um, parameters or switches. Um, we kind of label them as scope, as target, output, and info pad. So your target is what you want to run the, uh, the command list against, right? ESXi, you run it against one host or a list of hosts. 
Uh, the same thing for cluster and the same thing for data center. And if you want to do two hosts, you can just use the comma. Yeah. Right. Um, <clears throat> the output folder, folder path, um, you specify a folder path where you want to save the output. And you know, um, if, you, if you don't specify a folder path, then your file will be saved in the current PowerShell um, session. When you launch it, it's going to save it there. And export CSV and export Excel, they're um, the switches, right? Um, if you want to export a CSV or Excel file format. Mm -hmm. And by default, all the commands will give you every tab available. But if you want to restrict the command to only certain tabs, we can do it in the switches. Yes. Let's, let's go down a little bit. OK. Yeah. All right, if you want to know um, more information about each of the commands, one of the neat um, commands that I like is get help, the command line name and the show window. It opens up in a, in a pop-up window, and you're able to scroll. Right, read it if you want to print it. It's it's a pretty good, uh, pretty cool feature to get some help. Get we, some we, help. We documented the documentation scripts. So I think this is the, the part that most people will be interested in. What what exactly are the outputs, right? So maybe, all right, <clears throat> maybe we can make this a little bit bigger. Yeah. Maybe not that big. But. Everybody kind of could make up the text from the back of the room. Not really. Yes? Good. Yes. Thank you. Okay. All right. So all of this will be exported into um, Excel for all the hosts, and you'll be able to filter and organize and sort and create all beautiful reports um, if you like. But we kind of uh, give out a screenshot of what the output is, like for one item. And it's just important to know what all information is gathered from each commandlet. Um, one so of a, a thing that I find a lot of people have trouble is if I tell them, hey, can you give me a list of your hosts? with the serial number and the make a model. And people start looking in vCenter, and there's no such list in vCenter, but you can actually create it very easily in PowerCLI. And one of the things that Edgar blew my mind off was when he was able to also get the management IP, the rack or ILO IP. I was like, that's pretty neat. I didn't know you could do that. So, The, um, the firmware version of your ILO and your IDRAC is also important, especially when you know, you're troubleshooting and the first thing when you call HP is say, oh, what version of ILO are you on? Right? You're not running the latest version. Right? You, mm -hmm. you got to update it. That's uh, pretty neat. Yep. Very cool that you also had the version build. Uh, I think you had an, an, up, an update and patch. So those yeah. are things that we translate from in the version, and you actually use a, a little database there. Yeah. Why, why do you think that um, patch is blank in that, in that screenshot there? Any ideas? So the reason why is because in, in version 5, they don't have that, right? Awesome. Only, only version 6. I think we have a version 6 down there. Yeah. So, so keep in mind that, you know, the, depending on the version of ESXi that you run the commandlets on, the outputs may be a little bit different. For example, ESXi 6.5, I think it's the version that kind of supports for you to um, have a record of when the ESXi was installed. Because in previous version, it's all in the VIB, and whenever you update, that date changes, right? But in 6.5, maybe that would be a cool feature to add in there. Hey, I want to know when these ESXi was first installed, right? Like, how old are they? One of the things that Edgar added recently was the BIOS release date. Yeah. Because apparently, what was it, HP didn't really change the BIOS number? Yeah, when, 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 when you have HP servers, the, the, the model is either like P85 or P89, and actually like the actual BIOS version wouldn't go tied to the date that it was released, so that, that the release that kind of helps with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had, you know, very cool to see how many memory slots you have available as well. Yeah, interesting to know, though, that when you run it against a Blade server, um, you won't get uh, power supplies information, right? Cause right. Because there's mm -hmm. not... All right, so that's, that's one tab in your Excel sheet that you would have for, for all that output. Um, the other tab that you have uh, would be the, um, uh, the ESXi configuration. Yep. Uh, one thing that, that was critical for us is the way we manage licenses is we will put one license per host so it would be easier. So this will give you, for example, the license. It will tell you uh, which, uh, if it's connected to vCenter, which vCenter, what cluster is it on, what virtual data center. And if you want to go a little more down, you can talk about the software patch level there. Yeah, the software patch level um, we talked about earlier. If you had an ESXi um, 6 and above, you will mm -hmm. get that there. Um, um, very important feature is the EBC mode. Um, how many of you have um, Haswell processors that you're waiting for ESXi's to be updated to kind of support that EBC uh, mode? Yeah. 
What was, what was it that in it, it's only in version six that Haswell is an EVC mode available EVC mode, yeah. right? So yeah. getting that maximum EVC mode on your hosts is great when you're building out clusters, right? Yeah, and it, it gives you an output of your um, NTP configuration, NTP service. It's very critical for an ESXi. Um, if you're if you have three hosts in a cluster and they're not um, in sync with time or NTP service is stopped on one, when you be motion, right, you mm -hmm. run the risk of those um, clocks queuing on the VMs. And you also have, you know, if you have a syslog server configured, it would give you that output and that the service enabled. One of the first people that we asked to run this, he actually came back and said, once I ran it, I figured out my, my syslog settings were all over the place. So once you see this, you can actually figure out what you can improve, right? The, um, the get ESXi IO device command line is um, very neat that help you, um, helps you with um, HCL validation. It would dump all of that information in a tab for you and it would give you the actual HCL IDs, the firmware version, and the driver version that you're running on where you could take this information and validate against your um, VMware HCL website to know if you're running latest or you need to upgrade, right, without having the need to go into a, CLI mode and running all the manual commands. I remember once that we had a problem where the ticket uh, solution was, okay, up, change the firmware, change the driver. And we're thinking, uh, how many of these servers do we have and how many do we have to do this? So yeah. This gives you a way. Yes. All righty, the um, get ESX networking commandlet, there's a, um, screenshots for it. Um, there's screenshot for standard switch and distributed switch. Yep. So the main thing that I was very happy to see here is you included the port groups, active adapters, and standby adapters, and the security settings. One thing that I was uh, particularly bothering Edgar and telling him, hey, we need to include this, was the distributed switch version, which is something that may not be easy to get if you're not doing it scripted. And uh, um, for the distributed switch, your uplinks um, usually carry a name, right? If you, if you, when you go and look at a port group and you want to see what uplinks it, it is, the, you, don't, you don't actually get the VM nick, you get the uplink name. So this kind of ties this. And if you notice here, this one doesn't have any, it's empty. That's simply because the switch itself only has one uplink configured. That uplink doesn't have assign any um, mm -hmm. nicks. So VM kernel. Adapters, uh, one thing that I love is being able to see the, MCU, the MTU, the TCP IP stack, uh, enable services. So it's always good to be able to get just a list of what your IP configurations are. And you get an output of your physical adapters also. I'm super, super, I was super surprised when Edgar figured out how to query CDP and LLDP to actually get the switch information. You can see here that it says it got the, the in this case it's Cisco, it actually got the switch name and the port. So pretty cool. Yeah. How many here run distributed virtual switches? Have, oh, I'm super have, surprised. Um, that's that's more than 60%. I'm, I'm proud of you. Um, HP switches or non-Cisco switches that don't have CDP that you will have LLDP advertised for your port configuration. You know the pain. This will help you. Yeah, yeah, we have an environment where it's HP switches, and then you know the network guy told me, "Hey, it has LDP enabled, right?" So this helped, and I know now I know exactly where each port group is physically connected to. Yep. All right, going to storage. Um, it queries the storage adapters. Um, VMHBAs, uh, right? Via um, VMHBA, um, be it um, iSCSI or fiber channel. I, th I think even a, like a PCI device, it will have like a VMHBA assigned to it, so you That's can right. also get some of that. That's right. You see it here, the device, it gives you the name of it, mm -hmm. the model, and if it's a fiber channel, you get the, um, the WWN numbers for it. Then in the data stores tab, <laughs> you get a lot of the information that you're expecting, but one thing that we were finding when we were doing changes is we really needed that NAA ID. So having that NAA ID easy, because that, that's one of the IDs that doesn't change between one host and the other. So having that you know, easy to copy paste and not have to fish out in the GUI, that really helped us. We're super, super proud of the, you including the multipathing policy over yeah. there in that output. Because one of the things that you always, yeah. <laughs> you, you, you've, you've had the pain where you actually have to go through each host, checking it on the GUI to make sure you got it right. Now we can't script all of this. Yeah, if you have any Dell Ecologic and you have the, the EMC power path. The yeah. EMC power path, this will tell you whether or not you're running it. Mm -hmm. um, I find it very interesting that it has the file system version, especially for ESXi 6.5. You know, the new um, um, data store format 
um, has the, the reclaimed disk space, but you got to provision a new storage and migrate, this kind of stuff will tell you, you know, hey, how many data stores are out there that have what version of VMFS volumes mm -hmm. that you plan for it. So we, this is our official launch, but we had a soft launch. We started asking our friends to run it and to let us know what we think. We actually got some, some example outputs. Um, sure, thank you. Um, Michael Rurloff gave, gave us a bunch. You can, you can see the full output of his lab environment, which he actually had servers in his lab environment. But I wanted to highlight this uh, iSCSI output. Who here has configured iSCSI, especially with Jumbo frames? So, you, so you're gonna, you're gonna, this is going to go up your alley. We were able to see the MTUs at the physical adapter level. The, this, I think this is the VM kernel. The VM kernel mm -hmm. and the vSwitch. And you could also see the send targets, static, uh, static targets. And I think finally you could also see that the transport mode for this particular data store was iSCSI. Like so right. being able to check this like this is great, but when you're able to check it in your whole environment, looking at, you know, um, are, are all these hosts really, do they all have the same configuration? That's amazing, right? And uh, another of our friends, uh, Magnet, uh, Miter, uh, Walter, he actually provided uh, an environment where I said, let, let me take a picture of this because he output to CSV, but I just wanted to, sh want to show you. We've, we've shown you outputs, outputs of just one host so far, but this will take every host and put it in columns. So, you know, it's a very long Excel file this way. We, t we took a little screenshot there, there, but you can see that you get this information for all your hosts. So once you run it, you're going to be like, oh, I'm looking at my whole environment. I'm getting all this information uh, that I would normally have to do, be fishing around in CLI. I'm getting it all, all output, you know, really easily. And uh, Michael White actually blogged that out. So he blogged out like a, a previous version. Awesome. Kind of changed a little bit, but we're really happy that he was uh, blogging it out. We're hoping that you're the guys that are going to be blogging out a little more about this. You know, it's it's something that we did <laughs> by ourselves, and we're happy to share it. But we're also looking forward to more people using it. Maybe a go bit, a little bit over yeah, this. Yeah, a little bit of housekeeping. Those are the commands for you to update the, the modules. Right, they'll be there in the in the project page. Um, if you want to uninstall it for any reason. Right, that'd be it. That'd be your command there. Mm -hmm. And then, if there's any questions um, that we come across that are that are, um, we will try to post it there so anybody could go there and um, look at it. And we also have a change log, don't we, Aero? Yes, we do. So some common questions: What if I don't have internet? You know, Kyle already explained how to do this for PowerCLI. It's the same thing for us. Um, okay, which PowerShell version? Here's a link to help you upgrade your PowerShell version. Um, a little more information on that import Excel module. I would love for someone to run this on PowerCLI core. Let me know if it works or not. Otherwise, I'll, we'll probably do it next week or something. And we are, anytime we are going to do a change, we'll put a change of uh, any big, big releases. We're going to basically say, Edgar's already thinking, oh, let me make a version 2.0. I want yeah. to change, move out the modules. <laughs> he's, he's getting all, all, dev, all dev on me. All right. So everything that we covered today, uh, the presentation itself, the mind maps that we're doing, we're going to end up putting it in the GitHub as well. Yes. So this is where you can find the, the materials for the presentation later. I wanted to open up, I think we have some time, any questions so far. Maybe we can do like five minutes of questions. There's two mics, and they're completely open. If anybody wants to stand up, I think we have some time for that. Yeah, who has a mic? Oh, a mic? We have a question over there. Hello. Well, dash ESXi instead of VM host to be, anyway, I'm just kind of. Say, say it again. Why dash ESXi instead of VM host for consistency, but I'm just kind of anal retentive like that. You know, we probably spent like five seconds debating that. All right, we, no didn't, we, we didn't, didn't think much about it. So uh, um, someone I, else asked us why ESX and not ESXi. Right. Yeah. Semantics. Yeah. So most of my environment is auto deploy, pixie booted. I need to know sometimes when the, when they were last rebooted. Is that in there? I didn't see it. No, we don't have the uptime. Uptime. Yeah, and, uptime and, would be nice. And great yeah, feedback. great right. feedback. And also, we have been talking about how is this host installed? Is it installed to SD card? Is it pixie booted? Right. So we, we, we actually have to stop because we didn't want to break it before anything happened. Excellent. Right? <laughs> but, but, but we got a lot of ideas and, and the uptime one. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? See a lot of people leaving. We still have a little more. 
All right. So we want to talk about the future of this project. Um, those are the key points. Most, oh, sorry, please, sir. Whatever happened to the Power GUI editor? Power they used GUI. to be around for Power CLI and, and PowerShell. It was done there for a number, number of years. It's kind of floated around. Do you ever know where that went? I'm pretty sure I can bother Kyle about it. Some, somebody killed it? Well, no, they sold it off. They gave it away, but I never. Oh, they sold it. it off. Yeah. Ah. Dell bought it. That was the answer I heard. All right, thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. yeah. All right. So, even though we hear a, a lot of people saying, you know, this is kind of very nitty gritty, this is the base. You know, there's a lot of things that are running on vSphere on your on your vSphere environment. Every other uh, VMware product, vSAN, NSX, Horizon, SRM, depends on you having a stable platform. And now that you have multi-cloud environments, it's especially most important to look at all these details. One of the most hyped up books that have come out in the last few months is especially, specifically talking about just host resources deep dive. You remember yes. that one, Frank Deneman? Yes. It's 200 pages on CPU, but they, their argument was this things matter. People, you, it may not be everybody, but people who are building cloud environments, they should know and be worried about these things. And another thing that I, I think is, I always tell people is, skills and documentation, those translate very, very well. If you got good at documented in VMware or vSphere, et cetera, you're going to translate that to other things that you're managing and whatever, wherever your, uh, your career takes you, as well as scripting. Yes. Scripting is a big thing. So to kind of finish uh, uh, the talk, documentation, just document, having good, good documentation, it just makes operations easier. Uh, you have avoidable time sinks. I've, I've shown you where you can, you're not, you don't have to anymore go trace a network port or confirm a whole serial number. Um, there's a lot of things that, you, that we put in the scripts because we knew that we had to do it manually. So this is a way to you work harder, uh, work I smarter. Use it every day. Yeah, we use it all day. One of the first people that I gave it to, he told me weeks later, oh yeah, I use it all the time. I'm like, it's good. Yeah. So our, our vision was that, you know, this is going to be really helpful, but that was just two guys talking to each other. We really need a lot more users. We need a lot more people to tell us, hey, uptime, you know? It's, this is really what, what we want. And we're looking at, and we, we're thinking that someday you'll walk into a new job and they'll say, okay, so where's the documentation? I say, well, we just run these scripts, you know? And, no, that's perfectly fine. Those are great. So, awesome. Yeah. So that's the summary. I won't bore you again. Um, remember just to fight for that bandwidth to a properly plan, to properly do your, your, your stuff. That's where stability comes from, from being prepared and taking the time. And that's our session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Pleasure.